we're Thomson Reuters. You might know us mostly for the second part of our name, the, the Reuters, <laughs> Reuters part. We estimate a billion people of a, a day consume our media, either directly or indirectly, our articles, our photographs, our videos. Um, but we do, we're, we're much more than that. We're a much large, larger business. And some of the stories we're going to be telling you today is going to touch on some of those aspects. But I guess let's start by asking Myron, you want to quickly just introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. Thank you for allowing us the time to speak to you today and share some of your interesting stories. So, so my name is Myron. I head up the application development for our uh, Africa business. Thank you. Steph? Hi, everyone. I'm Stephanie, and I'm a Territory Account Manager at uh, Thomson Reuters Africa Hub. Cool. And I'm Mike Meaden. I look after our risk business. Now I'm going to tell a story about risky things in a second uh, <laughs> in our emerging markets. Um, and if I can have my first image, please. I want to start with something, and I apologize because this is Sometimes a topic that's a little bit upsetting. It's not necessarily <laughs> an uplifting way to start our stories. I assure you their stories are, are somewhat <laughs> happier. Um, but I like this image, and I always show it because you've all heard the phrase, crime doesn't pay, right? And it's something I tell my kids. Um, I'm just looking through the room. I don't see any kids. So um, I think we can be honest with ourselves, and that's a lie. Right? Crime, unfortunately, most definitely does pay, and stopping crime from paying is one of the most significant challenges we have as a species. We, the, the estimate is that in the order of $2.2 trillion gets made by criminal organized gangs on an annual basis, including, about, uh, including in the area I'm going to be talking about, and, it, and our entire theme is doing well and doing good. And we're a commercial company. We're listed on the London, uh, on the New York Stock Exchange. So as you can imagine, we most definitely do have a profit motive. But I think I can speak for all three of us on the stage and the vast majority of the people who work at our company that it's much more than that. I always tell our clients, uh, I don't get up in the morning to sell you something, right? Selling you something is part of my job, absolutely, and making sure you're happy and continue to use our services and our products is very important. But the reason I get up is because we, we actually genuinely do do good things in the world by doing well as well. And you can make a profit and impact society in a good way. And it's what, what I like to call conscientious capitalism. And if I can have my next image, I'm going to talk about slavery and child labor. Now, this picture is of a little child in, in India um, mining mica. Now, mica is a very soft mineral that gets used in paint production. Um, it makes it, uh, the paint shiny. And it was, it's kind of hard to mine because it's so soft. You need a lot of infrastructure and support and so on. That's the right way of mining it. The other way of mining it is with small little tunnels and children you send down them. But unfortunately, under those unsafe conditions, children end up dying. And that's child labor. Now, the International Labor Organization estimates that $150 billion of profit <coughs> get made from slavery every year. And I'm using the word slavery because I think we, we sometimes think of slavery as a 19th century problem as a problem you know, of Abraham Lincoln and a, and a problem of let's emancipate the slaves. But in fact, the estimate is, and these are estimates, nobody knows for sure, but the estimate is that there's upwards of 45 million slaves in the world today. And in fact, there are likely more slaves in the world today than there have ever been in the history of the world. And these slaves get used <laughs> in the production of hundreds of different resources, fish, shrimp, sugar, coffee, bricks, etc., etc. Now, bringing an end to the slave trade, and let's go back one step, 
the, the other kind of misconception we have about slavery is we, we, we tend to conflate slavery and human trafficking. They're obviously very closely related, but they're not one and the same. And we also conflate slavery with sexual slavery. And <clears throat> yes, there, it is obviously one of the most heinous forms of slavery, and it's, it's one that draws the most attention. But there are millions of slaves that are just in forced labor, in economic slavery, and they're kept where they are in India and in Bangladesh and in North Korea mm -hmm. and in Uzbekistan and in South Africa and in Ghana. And they're forced to work. They don't have a choice. They are forced to work where they are in producing goods and services. Now, this story um, has kind of a good ending, the Micah story. And it, it's <clears throat> all about once you make things transparent, once you raise people's consciousness about what's happening and all the bad things that are happening, there's human trafficking, there's slavery, there's counterfeiting, there's the illegal trade in rhino horn, there's deforestation, and not a lot of people know this, but the virgin forests of Mozambique is, as we speak, being decimated by illegal Chinese logging, and we're at risk of losing all of those forests in the next couple of decades. And shining a light on this problem, I think immediately, if I look at your faces, I don't think I see a single person who wants to consume a single good produced by a slave, even if it's cheaper. I mean, speak if you <laughs> disagree with that, but I, I'm yet to come across an audience that does want to. You would rather pay double for a good than consume a good that comes from a slave. And that fact is incredibly powerful. Your average person does not want to consume these goods. The reason they do, and I do, and you <laughs> almost certainly consume some goods and services that ultimately come from a slave, is because we can't identify and we don't know which is which? Which are the good supply chains that are free of slavery, where people have done enough due diligence and used the data that's available to understand these supply chains to make, make it as clean as possible? Distinguishing that supply chain from the supply chain that's dirty, that's full of slaves, that's, uh, you know, with poor labor practices or people that employ um, child laborers is fundamentally important. And the, with the Micah story, a lot of these... The, a lot of the, the, the mica that was produced in these child mines actually ended up on Volkswagens. Right? So Reuters, the Thomson Reuters Foundation, actually publicized this information, made it known that this was happening, and that 10 children had died in a six-month period from this mica mine. And, and Volkswagens' immediate reaction was, we don't want anything to do with this. This is clearly unacceptable. And they shut down the supply chain that had this mica in it. Right? If you give people the information, they tend to make the right decisions. And if I can have my next picture, please. I just want to talk about the importance of professionals when it comes to the crimes we're talking about. Because we like to imagine a criminal in a particular way. Right? If I talk to you about a slave trader, I think you probably have, did everybody see the CNN uh, Libya story. You, you're probably imagining someone like that. Or, or if I tell you who's a gangster, who's the bad guy, I, I bet your mental image is of a, a man, a rough guy with a gun standing on a street corner. But the bad guys depend on other people to actually profit from their crimes. And they typically put the profits from their crimes into the financial system. And they re the reason they do that is actually very interesting. And I always say that cash doesn't scale. It sounds weird, but bear me out. If I had a million dollars and I handed it to Myron, and I told Myron, you know, I like you, here's a million dollars. Just bear in mind this money is, uh, <laughs> is not, uh, not very clean. Be careful with what you do with it. Now, I think his first reaction might be to be quite happy. A million dollars, right? That's a lot of money. But now think... What is he going to do with that money? And how is he going to spend it? If he shows up at Standard Bank and says, oh, here, I want to deposit this, please, they're going to ask him some really hard questions about where does this money come from, right? They're not just going to accept the money. And all the banks in South Africa are the same. You can't just show up at a car dealership and pay cash 
for a Lamborghini, right? That's not going to work either. They're also going to ask you all sorts of tough questions. Cash is actually very inconvenient, and not only is it inconvenient because it's heavy, right, and it can get stolen, it's insecure, right? And that is why we all have bank accounts. Does anyone here get paid on the 30th by your boss handing you a wad of cash? I don't, right? Because that's inconvenient and it's insecure. It gets paid into your bank account. So the important part here is the professionals that make those kinds of services available, the lawyers, the bankers, the accountants, have a responsibility as well in this sphere. And I think that is where you make the most powerful and impactful difference or at least where we can make the biggest difference. So Thomson Reuters, we're not an NGO in the field trying to save slaves. I think that's very important and 100% behind and support those people and report on them. But we see our role as giving, especially the professionals, the information they need so they don't do business with people and they work with law enforcement to free these people. And we have a global database, something called WorldCheck, and WorldCheck gets used by all of the banks. And we track and try to systematically exclude slave traders from the f global financial system. And I want to just tell you, end off with one story. And if I can go for my next, my last image. I love this picture. It's the, the, the daughter of a zookeeper. Um, and I always like to say that if you don't take these issues seriously, if you're in one of the professions or one of the areas where... Um, the bad guys could potentially misuse the services you have. And if you don't take that extremely seriously and take your responsibilities extremely seriously, and it's not just the job of compliance to tick a box and say, yes, we have checked that this person is a pep, yes or no, right? That is the minimum. If you don't take your responsibility you have to indirectly make sure that the slave traders can't benefit from selling human beings, then you, you're this girl playing with this hippo. I would, as a father, I would never let my kids do that. I don't know about <laughs> you. So that's one of the reasons I like this picture so much. Um, so I wanted to finish off with a story. So w we have this global database, and it's 400 people uh, across six offices, and the global headquarters is actually in Cape Town. And the story is that we have two, and the reason we're in Cape Town, by the way, it's relatively cheap. And it's very cosmopolitan and diverse, so you get language skills. You can get very highly skilled and educated Italian speakers, Romanians, Russians, etc., all in Cape Town. So that's one of the key reasons we have a, such a big research center there. Mm -hmm. And two of our Romanian researchers working in the Cape Town office found a human trafficker just by looking at publicly available information, identified that this man was involved in kidnapping young women from Romania, making false promises, then trafficking them to the UK, and there took their passwords away, passports away, and they were stuck in, in slavery, or being sexual slaves in the UK. And they identified this man. We added him to WorldCheck. One of the big banks in the UK, who's our client, immediately found that they were doing business with this particular person. They alerted the police, and the, the police tracked this person down and, s and freed 15 women who were being held in sexual captivity. So those professionals with responsibility in this case took it extremely seriously. And our head of research, who's been doing this job for many years, always says, for all the pain and suffering and the late nights and the work he's done over the, the many years he's worked on this particular uh, product that we have, would be worth it if... All he had achieved in that time is saving those 15 Romanian mm. women. And I think that is the real story you can tell if you truly are committed to making a profit and also making the world a better place. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm up. Hi, everyone. So <coughs> I always feel very like taken aback when I hear these kinds of stories and a little bit sad. But today I, I want to talk to you about something a little more uplifting, which is 
my passions, you know, my passions in life and how through uh, my day-to-day -day job and through working at Thomsonworks, how I can, you know, zone in and really focus on those. So, I mean, I've always lived my life by little mantras. I want to leave the world a better place than what I found it. Um, and it's allowed me to incorporate three main characteristics into my everyday life, you know, whether it's personal or work. And that's integrity, honesty, and loyalty. Um, and so far, it's, it's worked very well for me in all aspects. Um, and at Thomson Reuters, so like all of you, I have, you know, certain passions in life um, outside of work. And three of my passions are education, technology, and diversity and inclusion. I try and be as conscious as I can about all three of those areas, irrespective of, you know, what I do in my life. So, sorry, I'm very, so I've got cards. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, over the last few years, I've really been able to take my career to new heights at Thomson Reuters. Um, you know, leaders took, they, they took a chance on me. Um, I've always started, been in software, um, but I've always kind of stuck in the background, making sure that things get done. You know, I wouldn't be on stage, I would allow someone else to be on stage and talk about the story. Um, but over the, the last few years, when, when I, thinking back, I also grew up in a very small town where there's, I'm from Namibia by the way, there's literally one set of robots in the middle of town, that's how small it is. Um, and coming from that, ha working on my first computer when I was in matric, which is not that long ago, believe it or not, <laughs> um, to now, you know, being able to head up application development for a whole Africa business. Like that to me was such a sense of achievement. And, you know, again, leaders took a chance on me and I hope I haven't disappointed them. I mean, sometimes even I thought, like, what the hell are they thinking? But it's worked out so far. So I want to talk to you about those passions. So if I think technology, that's something that I work with every day. I mean, that's business as usual. But at the same time, I get to engage with such a wide network of people through, um, you know, working with clients, with our customers to solve real challenges, not only in South Africa, but but in Africa, and really understanding what those challenges are. Um, I work with some of our customers. Liesl and I um, serve on the blockchain consortium together. So I've been able to forge those kind of networks and really take not only our business um, addressing the challenges we have on the continent, but also taking my personal passions forward. You know, because at the center of it all is me as a human being and you and all of us, you know. Um, <coughs> so the, the next thing that I want to chat to you about is we've got a future um, leaders program. It's, it's a lot like the grad program that RMB was talking about, uh, where we take in new grads every year <coughs> and we try and equip them with the business skill they need to take their careers forward. You know? um, we give them the tools, we give them the training we take them through a very rigorous process of everything from, you know, how to write an email to public speaking and to actually learning within the specific field. And the other day, my grad turns to me, I was asking him about a project that he's working on, and he turns to me and says, do you think this is easy? I said, Look, no, I, I know it's not easy. I don't want it to be easy. You know, you're not sitting here just to have something to do. You're here to learn, you're here to grow. And my job is to lead you on that path. My job is not to hold your hand while you swim. <coughs> my job is to walk beside you, and, and when I see you drowning, I will grab you. That was my response to him, and he sat there thinking about it for a while, and he actually came back to me afterwards, and he said, thank you for that. Because a lot of the times, I think, you know, we get these opportunities, but we don't fully embrace them. And I think through this graduate program, my point is really, I get to fuel my passion for education. Now, the one thing, sorry, I forgot about the pictures <laughs> altogether. <laughs> so let's move uh, to the next picture, please. Um, 
we can actually go to the next one as well. So <coughs> I remember, I think it was about two years ago, um, there was a company, well, a global company-wide email that came out regarding a leadership conference for LGBT um, management and leaders in London. And the conference was going to be us, Thomson Reuters, in conjunction with one of our biggest clients globally. Now, I'm sitting there, I'm thinking that this is something that really speaks to me. You know, diversity and inclusion all together. And I'm thinking to myself, like, how do I do this? Because I just moved to a new manager who we haven't had the chance to really form that personal bond yet. Anyway, I compiled my email application. I planned my exit strategy for lunchtime. When lunchtime came, I had my phone, I had my keys, I had my tag, I had everything ready. I literally clicked send and I ran. Because I had no idea what the response was going to be to me wanting to go to this. And about two minutes later, I got a response. And my manager was so blasé, you know, about it, that I thought to myself, that is what I want diversity and inclusion to be. The f it should be just like someone wearing another pair of blue jeans or, you know, someone having a hoodie on. It shouldn't be something that stands out. And I think the point for me is I came back from, from that conference, very profound, um, and the one thing that I realized is I wasn't being my authentic self. I was being who I thought I needed to be in order to connect with people and advance my career, but I wasn't being me. And that's one of the conscious decisions that I made coming back from that conference. Now, this picture, love it. It's, um, I don't know if any of you have watched the, the movie The Greatest Showman. So it's a movie that Hugh Jackman made. It took him seven years to make it, just by the way. But there's one song in the movie. It's called This Is Me. Um, and on there, I've got a little piece extract from, from the song that I'd actually like to read out to you. I'm just going to step off here. So it says, when the sharpest, sharpest words want to cut me down, I'm going to send a flood. I'm going to drown it out. I am brave. I see the internet spelled it wrong. I am brave, I am bruised, I am who I'm meant to be, this is me. And uh, we can move to the next slide. Ultimately, that's, that's what I decided to be, myself. Um, looking in um, or out, respectively, you know, from certain groups, um, it's a very dull and unengaging experience. Like, there's nothing to gain um, if we move to the next slide. But as soon as we change that, FYI, I took this picture myself, both of them. <laughs> um, as soon as we change that, it becomes so much more rich, the entire experience, you know, the different um, expertise and experiences that we gain, the ability to learn from each other. And that to me is ultimately what it means to be inclusive. You know, we're very diverse, but we need to be inclusive, and that's one of the areas where I always feel we, we lack a little bit. And that is, that is why I drive this so vigorously and passionately. Um, if we move to the next slide. Okay. <laughs> so now you may ask me, like, why do I do all of this on a daily basis? And sometimes I ask myself the same question. Now, that is actually my car. And those are magnets that... A bunch of, uh, they're between five and ten year olds, there were six of them, were very excited about. They came running, they wanted to show me what they had done in the garage. And I got there and I thought like, hmm, okay, how do, well, how do I deal with this? <laughs> anyway, so one of the comments actually came out to say, well, you know what, it would have looked so much better with our art painting, art, art paint, but we're out. I was like, thank God for that. Because <laughs> <laughs> my other thought is like, is it really art paint or was it going to be permanent paint? Like, how do I get back from that? Um, next picture, please. And then if you look at that, that's a note that I got from a little boy who says, I love my dad. And <clears throat> I do it for him, you know, for the fact that he looks up to me as a father figure, even though I'm not his father. Um, but the fact that I can be a role model for him and help him drive and be better, you know, be bigger, be bolder, 
That's why I do this. Um, I do this for all our you know, future leaders of our communities, of our country, of our continent, because ultimately our world is becoming so small every day. Um, if we move to the next picture. Ultimately, I mean, I want to have fun doing it. I want to have fun driving diversity. I want to have fun driving inclusion. I want to have fun driving my passions in life. Um, so yeah, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm Francophone, so when, when I'm in an uncomfortable situation, which is public speaking, uh, I start thinking in French. So I have to keep translating every time. Um, anyways, as I said earlier, I'm a territory account manager at Thomson Reuters. And uh, I just want to share a short story about my journey, um, you know, into South Africa, then Thomson Reuters, and the fact that I'm standing here today speaking publicly <laughs> to you all. So I uh, moved to South Africa in 1997 when there was political unrest in the DRC. And uh, it happened all very fast and didn't speak English and thought, oh my world, <laughs> like what's going on in my life? So did my schooling here and learned what I did to, to learn, but it gave me a drive to believe that um, I could achieve anything that I wanted to and I never had to limit myself. So uh, my picture is up. So before I start on my story, this is the picture that I, I, I chose. Um, the, the dark background kind of symbolized what the world once looked like to me. And over the years and over the hard work, I find myself in the middle, the white spot. I'm not pure, but I am the white spot in the middle. And the colors to me represent all the infinite possibilities and how I could grow in so many different areas in my life, should I choose to want to. Um, so to start on the opportunity that I was given at Thomson Reuters to, to feed my soul and grow my career at the same time. To put it into context, I was hired at Thomson Reuters in 2008 as a junior credit controller. I had no experience in accounting. I don't even think I did accounting in matric. I'd never chose accounting anywhere uh, or, or anything that had to do with finance, actually. I didn't know what a reconciliation was. And, um, and that's my first clue that showed me that, okay, maybe this company is gonna be a bit more to me than just a job. It's actually going to start a journey for m in my life. Um, my background was, is hospitality management. That's what I studied. So I would think most people would, would say that, well, why aren't you applying for jobs in a hotel or in a travel agency? And previously, before that, I was a chef. So it was a, bit a big question, like why would you go and apply in a financial markets um, you know, company? You, don't, you know nothing about it. And my answer was like, why not? You know, no one knew I was going to, you know, end up in South Africa. I didn't even know that I was going to end up speaking English. I mean, for me, it was like so far-fetched, you know, but I was like, why not? And I had applied at the same time in another global organization where in my interview, um, <laughs> my interviewer laughed at me in my face after looking at my CV. And his question was like, what are you doing? Like, why are you, what makes you think you can apply for a position in this company with this. Are you gonna be our cook? Are you gonna <laughs> serve me tea? You know, I was like, okay, hospitality management is a bit more than that, but no, I was actually applying for another role within the company. So he's like, okay, we'll get back to you. The next week I interviewed, I, I was called by Thomson Reuters to go for an interview. Went for an interview, they saw my CV and asked me, I remember the HR lady at the time, she says, okay, I'm not gonna ask you about things that I suspect you may not know about. Describe your best recipe, <laughs> what you enjoy, your passion, my passion is cooking. She asked me, she says, describe how you would prepare your best meal and serve, a meal that you would serve to your family. So I described it, of course, with, and 
my eyes were shiny and I was so passionate about what I of the interview. She says, we'll get back to you. Thank you for coming. 24 hours later, Thomson Reuters calls me and offers me the job as a credit controller. <laughs> and the other company also sends me an email offering me the job. But what Thomson Reuters did is show me that they recognized something that was much deeper, my passion, my hunger for learning, for wanting more and not stopping myself just because the world and society says that when you have placed yourself in a certain box as a young woman, you have to stick to it and just carry on on that path. So I then learned everything I needed to learn in credit control. Um, they taught me, they, they sent me on training programs. Um, five years later, I had not only learned but really excelled at my role, got recognized globally by the management team. Uh, it was really a good time for me. I felt really, really good in terms of what I had achieved. Um, then I went to my management team again and said, I think I'm ready for something else if you would allow me to continue growing within Thomson Reuters. And they, once again, they said, sure, <laughs> what, what do you want to do? So I was like, well, I want to learn more about the financial markets. I want to deal with people. I'm a people's person. Uh, you know, I want to be able to, 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 to feed off other people's energies and learn what other people you know, are doing in the world and not get stuck in, always getting stuck in what you are currently doing. And they were like, okay, we, we had faith in you five years ago, we'll have faith in you now. They opened up an opportunity and I became an account manager uh, in 2013. Again, I could hardly make you know, the difference between what was foreign exchange and fixed income. I didn't know what they were talking about. But again, they showed me that they were willing to, they believed in me even when I had a lot of doubts sent me on training courses, and I learned once again. And today, I am a territory account manager looking after many countries where we have a, you know, a client base, and again, achieved more than I even thought I could achieve. But Thomson Reuters actually gave me all the tools that I needed in order to get there. But aside from that, so that's the career part. Aside from that, I also had always been very vocal about my passion um, in assisting the less fortunate. I had always, always been involved in different charities and, and um, you know, NGOs. And Thomson Reuters, again, gave me, said, okay, fine, you will lead, not only just be part of, but you will lead our, our corporate uh, social responsibility uh, committee. And gave me all the tools and resources that I needed in order to help different NGOs and, you know, from as little as just needing to buy groceries for the smaller NGOs to actually building houses, you know, with Habitat for Humanity, they were willing to put that faith in me and trust that I would do what needed to be done in, you know, in the tell you a story, you know, of a young woman who, who, who was actually very confused and and, 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 you know, and not quite sure of where I would end up, to being nurtured, respected, um, you, you know, and, and grown into the woman that I am today. And Thomson Reuters basically showed me th and believed that I could actually fulfill my career ambitions and my passion for charity under one roof. Thank you. Sorry, before we take questions, I'd like to just add to that. So <coughs> at TR, we have um, quite a number of what we call business resource groups, which is like affinity networks. Um, so we have Pride at Work, we have women at TR, we have Black Employee Network, um, and Steph leads our global volunteer program for the, for the Africa region. Um, and one of the things that make me really proud is the fact that 60% of our senior leadership team in, in the Africa business is female. Um, you know, as part of our diversity and inclusion program, we, we have a mandate that managers need to consider three out of five diverse and, inclus diverse and inclusive candidates for any vacancy available. Mm. We're not excluding anyone, but we open it up. 
you know, that's the, the, the slate that we've uh, put in place. Now, sometimes, you know, um, guys ask me, like, so 60% is female, you know, what about the men? I said, well, the men need to work harder. The men need to be present more. You know, we need to, we're now being measured on a baseline set based on the best talent, you know? We're not gonna be able to advance our careers based on anything other than merit. Um, so I just wanted to add that to Steph's um, piece on our, thank you. Question. <laughs> about two weeks ago, and I had a very strong feel of a, a lovely, uplifting culture in Tonsonoso. What is that culture, and how do we get that it's just in the organization as you walk in the front door? Is, is that yeah. towards me? All right. Um, okay, I've been at Tonsonoso for 10 years. It's a, it's a good and difficult question to answer, <coughs> and I think my... <coughs> The, the first thing that comes to mind is the people. We have, and I think that's probably also in terms of HR and the hiring process, we don't concentrate on just the skills and the you know, education that you may have had. A lot of it is personality. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's what you bring aside from your skills and your uh, you know, your educational background, you know, and I think it's made it so easy. Because we have that family um, environment at Thomson Reuters, and I think that that's what shines through when people visit the office, because it, it automatically feels like a home, and not just a corporate organization where people just come and type all day. And I think maybe that's what you're picking up when you come and visit our offices. Anyone wants to comment further on that. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> So, I mean, one of the things is thinking outside the box. There should be no box. There should be no box to think outside. Um, we allow people to fail. Fail fast, and we learn from it. We fail together, we learn from it. Um, so, there's, we have an innovation lab, for example, in, in Cape Town, which is where, you know, you find the data scientists and all these fun gimmicky stuff. Um, and anyone is able to go down there. You can sit in the labs, you can work on a, I don't even know what it's called, it's these weird couches that they have there. <laughs> but the point that I'm trying to make is, you have to allow people to fail. It's the only way that people will, number one, be authentic enough to, to bring themselves and to say, um, you know, I can learn from this. I want to experience something new. I have something else to bring to the table. If they don't have that culture of, um, you know, that it's okay for me to fail and I want to try better next time, then they're never going to come to the table to start off with, mm -hmm. which means you're losing out on a whole uh, multitude of, you know, different experiences and skills and, and expertise. So I don't know if that kind of answers your question. I just want to add to that. I think something that's very important that I'm always consciously trying to contribute to our culture is breaking down those perceived hierarchies and the perceived domains. So you, you sometimes have people who think, oh, such and such is above my pay grade, or this is not my problem, or 
you know, I've got my little box that I need to work in, and this is what I'm responsible for. And, you know, when, when I speak to my colleagues and, and when I act in the, the business myself, I try very consciously to say, well, yes, I've got my core areas of responsibility, and if I, you know, if we miss target, I'm going to be in trouble, right? So, so that's fine. But it can't just, just be that, and you need to think wider outside of just your role. And there can't be a sense that, you know, um, Myron is higher in a hierarchy than me in, in terms of a, um, a contributing to the company sense of why. Yes, there's reporting lines and there's management that needs to be re respected. But if I've got a brilliant application idea, I should go to Myron and tell them about this idea and he can, you know, do with that information as he wishes. And if he has a brilliant idea of how to, I don't know, grow the business in Zambia, then he brings that to me. And breaking that down is extremely difficult in those hierarchies and those domains and that, that box thinking you were referring to. But I think that's one of the, the key elements to the culture. And it's also the, the tone that comes from the top, right? I, I think it's very difficult to overestimate how important that is. And it's not just, everybody always talks about tone from the top in the sense of compliance, mm -hmm. and yes, I think it's brilliant that everybody in Thomson Reuters, if you have to pay a bribe to, to get the business, we don't want the business. And everyone from the board, right down, every single person mm -hmm. in the company believes that very firmly. And there's that aspect, but there's also the aspect of, you know, we can hire a chef and make them into <laughs> a territory <laughs> manager like Steph and make her successful. And that out, not boxy thinking is very mm -hmm. important. done when it comes to performance man I'm, I'm not in HR so I don't mm. want to speak for HR but j just from my kind of limited perspective is that instead of having metrics and KPIs that are linked just to a performance metric so it's, it's not just you're not just your number so if you're a salesperson obviously your quarterly target is very important and if you miss it repeatedly mm. there's going to be issues right mm. but it's it's actually measuring those people on the success of the wider business. Mm -hmm. And it's also explicitly linking the performance metrics to our values of trust, of independence, and so on. And it's actually, sometimes we look at high performers who are hitting the numbers and getting the sales, but are not living the values. And that is almost a bigger problem than the person missing the target. Mm. Because it's very easy to, to sell unethically when you sell something that's complicated and oversell and overpromise and, and, and sell things that a client, you convince them they need rather than they actually need. Mm. Can I, could I add? Please. Um, the reason why I want to add to, to Michael's answer is because I've been on performance management a couple of times. Be, uh, times because, uh, like I said, my journey came from not knowing um, certain um, s certain aspects that were required in, in 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 the business I work in, which is financial markets. So it was, you know, I made it sound like a, it was an easy kind of flow, but it was actually a difficult journey, having to learn and. And going back to your um, your question earlier, you know about failure. When we were talking about failure, and uh, you know what I learned is that firstly I've never failed. I because I got up every time, and and my management team and HR, you know, were there supporting me on both sides through the performance management programs that we have. And it wasn't a matter of, like Mike said, of uh, you know only your numbers count and you haven't hit the numbers. It was a journey of um, of understanding my my leaders understanding me and and who I am at the core, and then showing me how I could do better, you know, still sticking to my core values, and then teaching me how to marry that with 
whatever, sales targets, um, relationship management with my clients, what kind of language I should be speaking. So it was a mutual learning and teaching journey. That's how I think we've managed it. And well, I'm still there, so <laughs> it's, it's worked. <laughs> and so the other thing on culture, culture isn't, you know, it's not an overnight thing. It never happens overnight. Um, so what's important that we try and do is we try to live it. You need to live and lead by example, ultimately. You know, it's, we say it a lot, lead by example, but what does it really mean? You know, it means that I live the culture every day. Um, our, back to our KPIs, 30% of our KPIs are based on, on our culture principles. You know, uh, trust, integrity, partnership, innovation. Um, we measure everyone um, by that specific piece because ultimately it's not just about the the day-to-day -day things. There's a bigger picture at play here. And I think one of the, the core things that our MD, Snash, which is an incredible human being, always says is, um, you know, you can, you can do well and do good. You don't have to just do business and make money. You can do that, and at the same time, you can do good. And I think that's one of the principles that I constantly think about. And when I manage my team, that's the kind of things that I look at. I'm not gonna, we've got a very flexible um, uh, work hour policy kind of thing. Like my teams, obviously different managers lead differently. Um, I'm not gonna watch a clock. You know, I will look at your performance on a project. I'm not gonna look to make sure that you're in at eight and you know out at five. Like, honestly, I don't care. All I care about is that as a team, we deliver on what we need to deliver. You know, if we have to take today off because we're exhausted, that's fine, we'll make up for it tomorrow. But ultimately, we're all responsible um, you know, for delivery of stuff. And the one thing that, and this is my personal experience or um, mentorship with my team is, I make them understand that, again, it's fine to fail, and ultimately, they're not gonna fail alone. It's my responsibility as their leader to ensure they don't fall down, to pick them up. And I have a manager and a leader who does the same for me. And I think that's the thing with culture. It's a, it's a daily thing you have to consciously live. Otherwise, it's, it's never gonna happen. It's never gonna change. Thanks. Thank you. Awesome.